I would like you to turn to Matthew. I know some of you don't because you know it's going to be up there. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Also, I would like to warn you beforehand that I have a meeting right after service. So if I'm running away, it's not because I don't want to talk to anyone. It's because I have a meeting that I have to go to. So Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to do your Acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen, then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who says what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. Amen. The title that I chose for this topic, for this passage today, is probably not the first thing that came to mind, but it was the thing that I believe uh, will help us to understand the passage and put it together a little bit more. Okay? Uh, the, the first thought that came to my mind was not everything done in secret is bad. But I went ahead and uh, chose the three righteous amigos. Because I believe that they tied together the point.
point of the passage and the emphasis of the passage. What is the emphasis? We're missing Gail today. She's on her way back. Okay. All right. Just let her know I miss her. There are three powerful spiritual acts that are expected of every Christian. Every Christian. If you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross, you believe that your sins were nailed to the cross when he was nailed to the cross. You believe that when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that he was talking about you. That you believe that when he said it is finished, it was all done, completed, signed, and delivered for you. There are three spiritual acts as a Christian that must characterize your life, your daily life. How you live your life. You should engage in these three things. One is giving to the needy. Second is prayer. And the third is fasting. And it is interesting enough that all three are to be done in secret. And we're going to talk a little bit about this because sometimes I'm, I am shocked at how people take some things too literally. Because if you take it too literal, you'll really never understand many passages in the Bible. Jesus said, every Christian must show these three things in their lives. Not once a year. Or every now and then, but ongoing. If you get into the passage, you will understand what we're talking about. Acts of righteousness. Acts that proceed from the righteousness that Jesus has given to you. You are not righteous, but Jesus made you righteous. It is what theologians call imputed righteousness. He gave it to you even though he knew you were just as unrighteous as anybody. In fact, if you don't believe me, the Bible says that it's non righteous. Not even one. So when you see somebody and you think they're righteous, think again. They're not. But I stand before you because of the righteousness that Jesus has imputed on me. Just as if I had never sinned. So what Jesus is saying is all of these three do them all to the glory of God. And if you go to do it all to the glory of God, you cannot do them with trumpets and announcements and add in the paper. Seeking men's praise and accolades. Let's look at the first amigo. Because they're friends. They should not be separated. They should be together. They should constantly be part of your life. How many people don't want to be with their friends? You don't want to be with your friend. These friends like to be together. Are you with me? Okay, the first one is alms giving or taking care of the needy in our society. This is foundational. Foundational. I'm not talking about your family members. A lot of us 
can take care of our family members who are in need. Some of us don't. But, you know. It's not that hard for you to help a friend. It's not that hard for you to help a family member. It's not that hard for you to help somebody that you know. When Jesus is talking, he's just talking about the needy. This thing is foundational. It is Old Testament based. It is God's command based. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 11. It says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and the needy in your land. He said, I do what? Command you. So you are now enlisted in the army of the Lord and the general is commanding you, this is something that I want you to do. Be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in the land. Now let's look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. He who is kind to the poor... Lends to the Lord and he will reward him for what he has done. So three things are very clear. There is a, there is a book that was written by William Pinson. Bill Pinson uh, about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago maybe. That's called Applying the Gospel. It was published by Broadman Press. Applying the gospel. If it's still in print, I recommend that you get that book. Applying the gospel. In fact, I should make it a requirement for all ministers and deacons. Applying the gospel. How do you make the gospel a practical, everyday living? So Jesus is saying here, let's go back, verse uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. So if you look at this, there are three things that are clear about giving to the needy. The first is... You need to give to the needy. It sounds simple, but it is a requirement from God. You need to give to the needy and do it. Number two, do it in secret. Do not announce it. Don't publicize it. Don't brag about it. Don't be ostentatious about it. When you give, you need to give in such a way that your right hand is not going to know what your left hand is doing. Today we say, Give it anonymously. Okay. But what we're talking about is very simple. It's a very simple thing in life. In other words, if I'm going to give to the needy, I need to walk up to the needy. I need to give it so that if, if Gina is the needy here and I'm giving to her, Sister Brown should not even know what's going on. Amen. And I am not, and I don't believe Jesus is saying, don't ever give something to anybody in public. Because he gave many times to people in public, in front of people. In fact, in one time he gave to over 5,000 people, not including women and children. 
That's not the point. The point is, what is your motive for giving? Is your motive for giving so that people can see you and people can hear you? So people can uh, love you? People can respect you? People can call you great? Generous? Humanitarian? Are you seeking people's recognition for the things that you do? If that's what you want, Jesus said, you're going to get it. You are not going to be denied. You will get it because men know how to praise. But guess what? Don't expect anything from God. Because you're not going to get anything. Anything that you do for people and you have announced it, forget it. It ain't recorded in heaven. You guys are so serious this morning. <laughs> it is not recorded for you. If you're seeking men's glory, if you're seeking men's recognition, you already have it. What is important is our motive. I remember one time I was announcing people that gave this and gave that uh, while we were building the hospital in Africa. And Dick and Allen came to me after church one day. He said, uh, uh, Pastor? I said, yeah. I said, I'd rather you don't announce my name. I said, well, the, the report is there. Your name is on there. He said, well, do, just skip over my name. I said, why? He said, because I want my reward in heaven. Amen. <laughs> I do not want to miss my reward. But, you know, I mean, that, that's a point to what he's saying. But just because your name was announced as one of those who gave doesn't mean you're not going to get a reward. Because your motive for giving was not so that your name could be announced. Your motive for giving was so that the hospital could be built. So that we can minister to people who are sick and who are in need. So Jesus is not condemning that. All he is saying is when some people want to give, especially in the synagogue, they used to do this. And by the way, it was part of God's command to the Old Testament farmers that when you harvest, you should harvest everything and then you need to collect the good ones, not the bad ones, not the ones you don't want to sell and all that. Collect some and put to the side. Every farmer in Israel puts something to the side so that the needy can come to their farm and pick up. Read Deuteronomy. Read uh, Numbers. Uh, read uh, Exodus. You're going to see all the commands that God gave to them so that they can take care of the poor, of those who are in need among them. Our motivation should always be the compassion that we have for people. The compassion that we have for people and our desire to please God. Amen? When you give a cup of cold water, make sure you don't announce the cup. Give it. And do it all to the glory of God. Now, your giving should be a friend to your prayer. Three amigos. If you give and your prayer life is pitiful, you are not understanding the message of Jesus. And I'm going, to, I'm going to let you know why I'm saying that later on when I make my third point. But the point is, privacy is the key to prayer life. Let me repeat it again. Because I'm not, Jesus is not forbidding public prayer. Because if he were, he would be saying something against what he did himself. Just like he gave in public 
He also prayed in public. But if you read the Bible, you're going to see that many times he put himself aside to pray. And do you understand something? Most Jewish homes were built in those days with no doors at all. The only room in the house that has a door is the prayer room. Because that is supposed to be done in secret. When you go in there, shut the door. Amen. Amen. Don't tell everybody, I'm going to the prayer room. <laughs> and when you get in there, God probably slap you two times. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray, standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The first thing about prayer is our prayer ought to be driven by private prayer. Let me repeat that again. Some of you didn't get it. Your, your prayer life should be driven by your private prayer. The, prop, the reason why some people have problem coming to public prayer is because they have problem with private prayer. If you know what it means to be in prayer, you ought to jump anytime somebody calls you to come pray. Because you know what it is to be in the secret place. If all the prayer you have in your life, all the prayer that you do in your life is public prayer, you're the most pitiful Christian. It's a combination. God wants us to pray together. If you see the book of Acts, you see how the people of God went. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, it told us that uh, Peter, James, and John, they were going into the house of prayer at exactly 3 o'clock as their custom was to go there and pray. Not only did they know when they're supposed to do. The beggars know when they're supposed to be coming in there. That's why they need always prayer time for the followers of Jesus. Let me go stand there so I can get something. They were standing there not to get prayer. They were standing there for money. They beg. A lot of people go and come beggars. Beggars want to, you know, want to be in a place where there are a lot of people passing by. And the second thing about prayer is not, the first thing is that it should be private. The second thing is that it should not be for a show. It should not be for a show. Uh, that's why Jesus said, don't be like pagans. Every time pagans have something good, they want everybody to come see how good they are. Say so when you want to pray, and how do you know that someone is really following paganistic ways of praying? Too many words. Too many repeated words. If you're concerned about the length of your prayer, And when you already hear too much of your own voice, you're praying like the pagans. And that's why Jesus gave them uh, a, a model prayer. Look at it. 
Uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who uh, hold us, uh, who uh, debt us against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When you go to Luke and Mark, they added to it, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, it's really amazing that he gave us a model prayer. And if you time it, say that prayer and time it. it won't, it's not even long enough to meet the introduction some of us have for our prayer. I mean, some of us will, will start with Jesus. 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 <laughs> Just imagine how how many of us are if I if I want to talk to you. And I say, I need to. Anita, <laughs> Anita, <laughs> I mean, do that in your privacy. You can spend five hours saying, I need to, that's okay. It's in your privacy. And it's really interesting that uh, one of the most, uh, probably the best New Testament scholar right now, I, I have to say that, and, and you can debate me, but Probably the best New Testament scholar alive today was Dr. Is uh, Dr. Uh, Don Carson. He happened to have been my Greek professor in college. He said, it is our Lord's model prayer. It is not the Lord's prayer. That's the model he placed in front of us. See, when you want to pray, this is how you should pray. This one should relate to God. And notice that he just said, our father. Amen? No, no, no. I'm not trying to joke here. He didn't say, our father, at least 20 times. He talked more about his name. Hallowed be your name. Talked about his kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First giving glory to God. Honoring God. Praising God. And then. Give us something. Many of our prayers are full with give and not honor. And uh, I used, I've, I've always been so interested in when preachers and pastors have been asked to give public prayers, especially presidential inauguration. Are you sitting in there? Sometimes I'm thinking God didn't understand that prayer. The third amigo is fasting. Remember I said they all go together, right? Now, let, let, before I go into fasting, I need to show you something. If you have your Bible, some of you don't have your Bible. You're looking at the, at the uh, board there to see what it says. But I want, to, I want to share something with you real quick. 
if you look at verse 2 of chapter 6, it says, So when you give to the needy. Okay? Underline that. So when you give to the needy. Underline it. Now, look at verse 5. How did it start? And when you pray. Are you, are you following? Okay. Underline that. And then when you get to verse 16. It said, when you fast. Okay? Notice that it did not say. Verse 2, if you give to the needy, are you following me? Verse 5, it did not say, if you pray, and verse 16, it did not say, if you fast. It says, when? When? If I say, when you come to my house, That means I'm expecting you. And you better show up. Now if I say, if you come to my house, that is left to you. That's subjunctive. It is conditional. It's the, your choice. But when it says when, it's no longer your choice. It's something you've got to do. Amen? Amen? When you go for your medical checkup, it means you need to go for a checkup. So when Jesus said, when you pray, when you fast, when you give to the needy, it means that he is expecting you to do all three. If you're a Christian. So I said all that just to say fasting is not just something that is given to Muslims. Many of us Christians don't know anything about fasting. And a lot of us when we fast, oh my God, we have done something that has never been done since the 17th century. Fasting is not for a show. It must not be done for a show. So does that mean that we cannot do it together as a church? No. Why would you say that? Come on now. Come on now. I, I just want to make sure you're still awake and you're following me. Why will we do it together? Because the word says so. Okay, are you sure? Where? Acts chapter 2. Okay. Anybody else want to guess? Yes. Okay. And God heard their prayer and he changed his mind and he saved this and the prophet got mad at God. Right? Okay. The point is that the Bible does not say we cannot fast together. But let me say this to you. If you're fasting at Village Baptist Church for a reason, and then you go out there in Marin City, and the first person you see, you make a brown face. <laughs> hey, what's wrong? Oh, we're fasting at our church. Oh, you just messed it all up. You messed it all up. 
Amen? Amen. And you fasting at your house and absolutely nobody in your house, including the parakeet, knows about it. It's fasting. That's not fasting. Listen what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you fast, do not look what? Somber. As the hypocrites do. Do you know what hypocrites are? Who, who, who are they? Actors. So don't be play acting. Amen. Jesus said, as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure, their, not that their faces were disfigured, but they themselves disfigure their faces. And many of us know how to do that too. To show to people that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. So when you do that, you have killed spirituality with legalism. Fasting should be fought first and foremost something between you and God. So what Jesus is saying is when you're fasting, act normally. Amen. Don't go around complaining you're hungry. Many of us, you know, I, know, I know you're quiet because, you know, I'm hitting on a nerve here. Many of us, we just want everybody to know we're fasting. Everybody. Amen. Sometimes if you're fasting, your husband shouldn't even know. Your wife shouldn't even know you're fasting. Except if you're lazy and your wife cooks for you all the time. Uh-oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you could say, I just don't want to eat. You know? And, uh, yeah. Yes. That's a good question. It's a good question. Your son asked that question in Petaluma. <laughs> So father and son thinking alike. Um, fasting, the word fast literally came from being fast. Everything is going so fast you forgot to eat. Okay? You can fast for eight hours. You can fast for five hours. You can fast for a day. You can fast for two days. You can fast as is humanly possible so you don't die. Okay? Uh, fasting is not what they call this protesting something when you go on food strike. What do they call that? Hunger strike. Yeah. That's not what fasting is. Fasting is a spiritual connection with your heavenly father. And laying something before him that cannot be done except by prayer and fasting. See, a lot of times we just do prayer. We forget prayer has an amigo. And that's fasting. They go together. So you can fast for as long as you want. But it's really important that you understand this. Please, I know, yeah, you say, Pastor, you're old. I'm old, but I'm old according to the word. Okay? There's nowhere in here where it says not watching TV is fasting. That's right. You know, some people say, I gave up cigarette because I'm fasting. You 
should not be smoking to begin with. That's not fasting. Fasting is not eating food. F-O-O-D. Rice. <laughs> Gumbo. <laughs> Sister Wade. <laughs> Sister Wade can make a lot of people fast. Just stop. Say, I'm not going to cook for three days. <laughs> right, Sister Griffin? <laughs> so fasting is you taking uh, then is you taking the uh, initiative to say Lord I want to be close to you I want to be close to you in fact you know sometimes I, I, you know you shouldn't even plan your fast Because you are doing something to get so close to God that you don't even you're not even thinking about food. And I know many of you have had those times when you know you look at the time, it's three o'clock, and you haven't eaten anything. And you've been in prayer and reading of the word. Now, the Muslims, let me tell you something, and I'll shut up after this. Uh, the Muslims have interest in a God that they don't have. And we show less interest in the God that we do have. There is no devout Muslim that will not fast for at least 30 days in a year. Amen, church? If we Christians should just practice one day a week to fast, we would have fasted 52 days in a year. Don't just wait on the Friday that the church is fasting. No. Choose your own time that nobody else knows. Only you and God. Because the three must go together. Church, I want to tell you something. You're not practicing your Christianity. If you're not giving to the poor, you're not practicing your Christianity. If you're not praying, you're not practicing your Christianity. If you're not fasting, because the three go together. They are friends that have been given to you by God to make your life a life that is pleasing to him. To make your life a life that is dedicated to him. To make your life a life that is given to people. So that when you move, mountains move. When you move, problems move out of the way. Because you are in the presence of the great God Almighty. You are in fellowship with the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. And the Rose of Sharon. And the Lily of the Valley. You are there with him. And because you are in his presence. Oh, when Moses was with him. When he came out, everybody knew he was with God. He, you know, he didn't have to say, people, I just came from church. When you have been with God, people will know you don't even have to tell them. So, ooh. I went to visit somebody in the hospital, somebody that has known me for a while. And when, when I walked in, he, he kept asking people around. And I'm not saying this to, you know, put myself anywhere. But he said, man, when you walked in, I just saw that. And, oh. and I said, glory to God. God hates play acting. Let's remember. Giving loves prayer. Prayer loves giving. 
And prayer is a friend to fast. They have nothing against each other. They just love each other's company. And if you're following God, they all should show up and have something in your life. Amen? Let us pray.